everyone and a very warm welcome to the second discussion in this Hopkins at Home series with the Moore Centre for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. My name is Angus O'Doherty and I'm Outreach Director at the Moore Centre. Last week we heard Director of the Moore Centre, Elizabeth Letourneau, and journalist, producer and longtime Moore Centre collaborator Luke M M Malone discussed the Moore Centre's mission to demonstrate that child sexual abuse is preventable and why we all have a role to play. Today, we're going to explore this fundamental principle further, in particular by looking at public perceptions of child sexual abuse in the US. We're going to hear about an initiative to build a more effective narrative about child sexual abuse prevention. Understanding current public perception and whether and how we can together shift perception is hugely important. Fatalistic perceptions that see abuse as inevitable have far-reaching implications. They make political support for prevention difficult to achieve and funding for prevention programs hard to unlock. But by understanding how different narratives can change public perception, and demonstrate how we as a society can prevent abuse from happening, we are honing a tool which has the potential to transform how prevention is perceived, promoted, and delivered in the US and beyond. That's something we're very excited about and can't wait to share with you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Rebecca Fix. Rebecca Fix is an assistant professor working at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health within the Department of Mental Health and a faculty affiliate of the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. She's also a licensed clinical psychologist who has done therapy with survivors of trauma, including adolescents in prison systems for illegal sexual behavior. Her research focuses on promoting mental health equity and equity in legal outcomes within the juvenile justice system and on interrupting pathways from childhood maltreatment to the use of sexual and physical violence during adolescence. Dr. Fix has over 60 peer-reviewed publications, the majority of which are first authored publications, and her work has been funded by federal and local organizations, as well as through competitive internal funding mechanisms. In recognition of her expertise, Dr. Fix has been invited to consult with the Southern Poverty Law Center and Office of Juvenile Justice and Del Delinquency Prevention. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing about the vital work you pursue at the Moore Center. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Angus, for that lovely introduction. Today, I'm going to discuss an interesting study we are about to wrap up about how we are reframing child sexual abuse as a preventable public health issue. This session will cover a study myself, others at the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse, and our partners at the Frameworks Institute are wrapping up on framing strategies to use when we discuss child sexual abuse as preventable, and really how to steer thinking toward child sexual abuse as preventable. So child sexual abuse is preventable. I think many of us are in this space because we recognize that as an important reality. But there are many factors getting in the way of public recognition that child sexual abuse is preventable. In addition, there are multiple ways in which we are not moving toward prevention, but ought to be to promote public safety and wellness. A public health approach to violence prevention has been successfully applied to virtually all types of child maltreatment and violence with the single exception of child sexual abuse. For nearly three decades, experts have recognized this glaring omission and continue to call for child sexual abuse's inclusion within broader violence prevention efforts to no avail. 
The Moore Center was founded in part in recognition that a new approach is needed. Perhaps the main reason child sexual abuse is excluded from national violence prevention efforts is this strongly held perception that it cannot be prevented. Indeed, we've seen that early communication efforts to increase the salience of child sexual abuse actually highlighted the most severe consequences of victimization. And this sensationalist media portrayal of particularly horrific cases has historically and continues to reinforce this messaging. While these early strategies almost certainly succeeded in increasing public awareness of child sexual abuse, they have also encouraged beliefs that people with sexual offense convictions are unpredictable predators for whom the only viable responses are draconian criminal legal system punishment and shame. It is possible that criminal legal system sanctions may always be implemented as one strategy to deal with child sexual abuse, but alone they are an insufficient response to child sexual abuse that actually often do more harm than good. So if we consider the juvenile legal system, with which I am most familiar, there are only two ways in which juvenile incarceration or registration could improve public or community safety. First, they could promote safety by reducing sexual recidivism rates, or second, they could deter first-time sex crimes. However, there is no evidence that incarcerating or registering children and adolescents does either of these things. It does not reduce recidivism. It does not prevent first-time sex crimes. And there is evidence that these policies influence juvenile legal system procedures and that they hurt children and their families. So the amount of money that we waste on these ineffective and poorly targeted policies is really staggering. And this wasted money cannot be spent on victim and survivor services. It cannot be spent on rehabilitation for people who have engaged in child sexual abuse behavior or on prevention. So experts in the field recognize child sexual abuse is preventable, but if the public cannot envision child sexual abuse prevention, it won't support prevention efforts. Experts must be able to effectively convey a prevention focus if the public is to view child sexual abuse as preventable. Currently, a gap between the public's understanding of child sexual abuse as preventable and experts' knowledge about that issue, so this huge gap, is what's impeding the effectiveness of experts to influence public policy. And me and my team are here to say that such gaps can be overcome. In the work I'm presenting to you today, our team iteratively developed, evaluated, and is working on dissemination communication strategies and tools to improve the accurate transfer of knowledge from experts to the public about child sexual abuse, and particularly about child sexual abuse as preventable. So I'm going to review the study phases we have completed and our current phase of work, which is the final study phase. I will then use data we've obtained throughout the duration of our study to better demonstrate why framing is needed including challenges or barriers to viewing child sexual abuse as preventable and opportunities to frame the problem of child sexual abuse as preventable. I will then talk about our findings from the frames that we tested and will provide the exact framing languages for the two frames that shifted thinking about child sexual abuse toward a prevention orientation. That's a little teaser. Um, and we'll conclude with our project specific next steps. After that, we will have time for a Q&A. So this figure represents the research process for this project, which has included three major phases. Phase one is represented by the blue dots on the left, phase two by the yellow dots in the middle, and phase three with red dots on the right. Phase one primarily focused on identifying the broad cultural assumptions that people in the United States have about child sexual abuse and what can be done to address it. And it really focused and centered on comparing the public's perception with experts' understanding. Data provided some context for why child sexual abuse is not currently seen as a public health issue. We began phase one with a series of interviews. First was what we call the field story, during which experts' interviews were conducted. Their responses were interpreted and expanded upon during a feedback session with members of our own internal team and our 11 child sexual abuse prevention consultants. Next, public mindsets about child sexual abuse overall and child sexual abuse as a preventable public health issue were captured through cultural model interviews. 
These interviews were with members of the public and professionals working within child advocacy centers, who I will reference as practitioners, concerning thoughts about child sexual abuse, its impacts, and child sexual abuse prevention. And so just to reiterate, when I'm referencing professionals working within child advocacy centers, I'm talking about the practitioners. And when I say practitioners, I'm talking about professionals working within child advocacy centers. They will come up a few times today. So the, then we conducted a map the gaps analysis to compare mindsets that were captured during the interviews or field stories with the experts in cultural model, model interviews with members of the public and practitioners. And all of this culminated in a strategic beef brief, which I will briefly discuss next. We then moved into frame development. And this consisted of three tasks to see how our broader framing language was received overall. This included brainstorming about types of frames and content to include, include therein. We also did smell tests through individual interviews to see how frames resonated with people. And we collaborated and iteratively generated frames with our team of consultants. Frame testing was the next step after we had developed some frames. And during this, we did on the screen interviews to test frames, including their stickiness and effects, particularly on thinking about child sexual abuse as preventable. And we also did surveys to experimentally examine framing effects, again, on perceptions of child sexual abuse as preventable. But we also used those experiments to look at whether or not they, the frames encourage support for policies to prevent child sexual abuse and or to support policies focused on punishment as a response to child sexual abuse that has already occurred. And from that, we identified the two best frames, which I will share later. And now we are moving into phase three, where we are interpreting and determining the best ways to apply our findings. So I'm going to talk some about the findings from the first phase of research here. The first phase of research really helped clarify misperceptions and misunderstandings that are held by the general public and practitioners in comparison with knowledge held by experts in child sexual abuse prevention, all through individual interviews. So the first barrier that we're seeing and why framing is needed is that there is a punishment orientation in our society when it comes to responding to illegal behavior broadly. And the public and practitioners see public see punitive criminal legal system measures as the best way to address child sexual abuse. So the understanding that child sexual abuse is primarily a criminal justice issue leads people to think that child sexual abuse is solvable only after the abuse has been perpetrated. In other words, after the perpetration and detection of a crime. And this perspective really is antithetical to public health perspectives and steers people away from thinking about child sexual abuse as an issue of violence prevention alongside other public health violence prevention efforts. Second, we identified misperceptions about survivors of child sexual abuse held by the general public. The public tends to think that survivors of child sexual abuse have experienced irreparable damage or reparable damage, sorry, to, um, and this way of thinking that child sexual abuse survivors are irreparably damaged is stigmatizing, it positions survivors as damaged and destined to experience lifelong challenges to their well being and relationships. And if people believe that there isn't a realistic chance of helping survivors overcome the trauma that they've experienced, they might assume that there's no point in trying. And this makes it hard for the public to see value in providing survivors with resources, supports, and therapeutic services. And third, there are three key misperceptions that people have about individuals who engage in child sexual abuse. First, the public and some practitioners see pe people with child sexual abuse convictions as sociopaths or evil people who lack basic moral sensibilities. This way of thinking is quite unproductive. It positions child sexual abuse perpetration as impossible to understand and in so doing, it blocks thinking about why child sexual abuse occurs and how it can be prevented. Second, there was a demonstrated lack of awareness that people who have a sexual attraction to children do not want to act on it. That there are people, sorry. So there's a lack of awareness that some people have a sexual attraction to children but do not want to act on it. And of course, there are many barriers in place for people who have a sexual attraction to children who want to seek care. 
Um, this will be discussed in greater depth next week by Ms. Rizika and Dr. Shields. At any rate, because people do not recognize that some people can have a sexual attraction to children but do not want to act on it, it makes it difficult for them to identify that key preventative solutions like programs aimed at people who want to help control their, um, their sexual attraction, those, those ideas about those preventative solutions are completely off the radar for both the general public and for practitioners. And lastly, the public and practitioners do not think about adolescents as people who engage in problematic sexual behavior against children. So like Dr. Laterno mentioned in the session last week, half or more, and some data actually coming out of our center suggests that perhaps up to 70% of sexual offenses that are committed against children are committed by children, many of whom are close in age. And this may seem surprising, but it just makes sense if you consider that children who are just beginning to engage in new and complex behavior are prone to making mistakes and bad decisions. And people's inability to see that adolescents are responsible for a substantial proportion of child sexual abuse offending is a really important challenge. In particular, it makes it hard to appreciate that adolescent sexual offending is relatively common and driven by factors that are in a large part preventable. The first phase of research also helped us clarify opportunities to use framing based on existing views about child sexual abuse. And we view these as opportunities to promote, promote prevention messaging. So first there's recognition by the public and practitioners that child sexual abuse is a widespread problem that is underreported. The recognition that child sexual abuse is serious and a common problem is a useful starting point. However, the understanding that child sexual abuse is prevalent does not translate into deeper thinking about how to best prevent it. The public and especially practitioners also appreciate challenges created by the stigma surrounding child sexual abuse. People by and large recognize that the topic of child sexual abuse evokes highly negative and visceral emotional responses, often in ways that compound survivors' feelings of shame. This awareness opens up space for communicators to talk about how stigma can be addressed and to make the case for what needs to change to make it easier for survivors to come forward and seek help. The public and practitioners also see the value of home and school-based efforts to empower children to better recognize, resist, and report, the three R's, inappropriate sexual contact. This way of thinking productively draws attention to the knowledge and skills that help children better recognize, resist, and report inappropriate sexual contact. And it opens up space for people to think about interventions that empower young people to prevent sexual abuse, sexually abusive acts before they occur. Um, so for example, through educating young people about consent and the importance of respecting boundaries for themselves and others. And then this recognition also opens up space for people to think about encouraging children to report child sexual abuse after the fact through learning how to tell a trusted adult about violations of their sexual boundaries. However, that's not a true prevention focus, and communicators should really be careful in making this point without placing the primary onus of prevention on individual children rather on, than on society as a whole. And the last identified opportunity for framing was that practitioners really, and to some extent the public, recognize that talk therapy is an effective way of addressing the harms of child sexual abuse. So the idea that talk therapy is effective can be leveraged to counter the notion that survivors are irreparably damaged. And it can foster a sense of efficacy about the possibility of addressing trauma and disrupting cycles of abuse. So now we are moving into study phase two, where we developed and tested the frames. We conducted smell tests on the on-screen interviews with 36 individuals to test a subset of frames. And we also ran two experimental surveys with about 5,000, just over 5,000 nationally representative participants who each was randomly assigned a single frame to read. So as you might expect, just given all the pushback that there is in the public mindset about child sexual abuse as preventable, 
it was somewhat difficult to find a frame that moved the needle for people to view child sexual abuse as preventable. So for when we're looking at the survey, in the first wave of data collection, we tested nine frames and we tested 10 different frames in the second wave of data collection. The two biggest takeaways I want to share with you from this second phase are that we found 33% of people after reading the frames expressed perceptions of child sexual abuse as preventable. And the two most effective frames were the road safety frame and the help wanted frame. So I do want to say that 33% of people after reading frames believing that child sexual abuse is preventable um, is a great step in the right direction. Um, it might seem low, but not everyone received the frames that we would say are without we found were the most effective. Um, and it was a, a large improvement from conditions where people didn't receive a frame um, that was supposed to move the needle. So now I'm going to move into discussing the frames in greater depth. Sorry. All right, so the first frame that landed pretty well with people was the road safety frame. And this performed quite well during individual interviews and slightly less well during the experimental survey. This frame was helpful in large part due to sticky language, meaning language that people retain after hearing a frame, particularly the idea of guardrails. So this idea of guardrails promoted people's ability to understand that the focus of the frame was on prevention and addressing child sexual abuse. The frame also was effective in getting people to connect the idea of road safety to mental health prevention, namely counseling services for people who had engaged in child sexual abuse or who were at risk for engaging in child sexual abuse. And lastly, the idea of crashes was sticky in this frame with people being able to connect the idea of road safety to prevention to prevent major crashes through education of both children and adults, including caregivers and educators. So altogether, the road safety frame was able to shift people's thinking toward the idea that child sexual abuse pre prevention is possible. And I'm going to share that language involved in the frame with you now. And just as a caveat, these are two fairly wordy slides coming up. And the same applies when I get into the second most effective or the most effective frame, the help wanted frame. So the road safety frame reads, preventing child sexual abuse is like ensuring good road safety. To make sure that everyone is safe on the road, certain protective measures need to be in place, such as driver education, guardrails, and appropriate signage. In the same way, preventing child sexual abuse requires safety measures at many levels. One type of safety measure involves providing mental health care for people with an unwanted sexual attraction to children, which can help them cope with their feelings, and prevent them from abusing children. And it continues, education informing adults and children about personal boundaries and age appropriate behaviors is another protective measure that can help prevent abuse before it occurs. And directing funding toward rehabilitation programs can prevent people who have abused children in the past from doing so again, which makes everyone safer. As a society, we agree that road safety measures keep us safe when we travel. When people are educated on how to drive and when guardrails are in place and signage is clear, roads are safer and fewer crashes occur. In the same way, by building the right safeguards, we can more effectively prevent child sexual abuse. So this is the frame, the road safety frame that people read during the experimental survey and were, um, were read and, and viewed on screen during the on the screen interviews. And it was effective in many ways, in part due to the stickiness of the language, particularly the words guardrails and crashes. However, it did have one drawback for some individuals. During some of the on the screen interviews, people mentioned that the idea of guardrails made them think more about addressing child sexual abuse after it happens, like after the car crashes, rather than prevention. The help wanted narrative was the most impactful on promoting thinking about child sexual abuse as preventable. It also encouraged people to support prevention oriented policies. This transformational arc presented here. This is the theory of how it is um, 
this frame is uh, proposed to work. Basically, we believe that people reading this narrative were humanizing people who are at risk for engaging in child sexual abuse instead of othering them. They then were introduced to the ideas of perpetration prevention programming and how well received it had been by people at risk of committing child sexual abuse. And then this arc leads to recognition that child sexual abuse could, in fact, be prevented. The Help Wanted narrative significantly improved understandings about child sexual abuse, including that people who have a sexual preference for children will not always commit abuse. This frame also increased understanding of how child sexual abuse is preventable, it reduced support for more punitive policies, and it marginally increased collective responsibility for preventing child sexual abuse, which means that people were presenting um, with this increased collective responsibility and we're more likely to think that we are all responsible as a society for prevention of child sexual abuse and that the onus shouldn't just be on individual children or, or families, but it's really a societal issue. So here is the help wanted frame and I will read this as well. There are many people in the world who are sexually attracted to children but don't want to act on their feelings. When the right support is available, they can live productive lives and successfully prevent themselves from ever abusing a child. Below is Alex's story. My name is Alex. I am many things, a sibling, a runner, an artist. I am also sexually attracted to children, but I didn't choose to feel this way. In my commitment to keep children safe, I found a free online self-help program called Help Wanted. It was specially designed for people like me who have a sexual attraction to children but don't want to act on their feelings. After reading through hundreds of testimonials from participants who said the program was helpful in preventing them from abusing a child, I signed up. Help Wanted taught me the harms of child sexual abuse and provided clear strategies that helped me cope with my feelings in productive ways. The program created a supportive and affirmative environment and introduced me to positive role models who I can talk to when I need support. Free self-help programs like Help Wanted can help people like me gain the knowledge and support we need so that we can live productive lives and never abuse a child. After completing the program, I feel better able to cope with my feelings, know that I have good role models I can lean on for support, and am more confident that I will not abuse a child. Alongside other prevention efforts like education programs, rehabilitation programs, and policy changes, if programs like Help Wanted are made more widely available, I'm certain that we can more effectively prevent child sexual abuse. So again, the Help Wanted narrative was the most impactful on promoting thinking about child sexual abuse as preventable. And it also moved the needle and shifted thinking so that people were encouraged to um, want to support prevention-oriented policies more and were less likely to want to support punishment-oriented policies. So the road safety and help wanted frames were the two frames that were the most effective in moving people's thinking toward child sexual abuse as a preventable public health problem. Now we are working to develop resources and to figure out how best to use these frames to promote wider perceptions of child sexual abuse as a preventable problem. Overall, as pre prevented in these steps, we are creating a strategic communications plan and toolkit targeted to experts, agency leaders, and practitioners who communicate with the public, with policymakers, and the media about child sexual abuse prevention. Messaging strategies will include specific training on diffusing frame elements effectively in traditional media platforms, such as formal presentations, interviews, and op-eds, and in micro-messaging like tweets and other social media contexts. We also will develop materials specifically for journalists who will cover child sexual abuse and broader child maltreatment issues. And the overall goal of this communication plan is to provide practical resources to ensure communicators can provide accurate information about child sexual abuse prevention in ways that can overcome some of these knowledge gaps that we identified and that can really align public with expert views that child sexual abuse is a preventable issue. So um, just to go through each of these briefly, 
First, we are creating and will host an online e-workshop. This e-workshop will provide a guided tour through the implications of our strategic framing research on child sexual abuse prevention. It will also explain how communication fits into a larger vision for social change, and it will focus on helping learners develop a systematic understanding of the dominant narratives and cultural models that characterize public or practitioner understanding of child sexual abuse prevention. And it will teach people how to present information in ways that successfully navigate and bridge these understanding gaps about child sexual abuse that we identified. The e-workshop will also include interactive checks for understanding and practical guidance on how to apply framing concepts in professional contexts. It will provide specific guidance on messaging via traditional methods and social media platforms, as is pretty standard throughout all of these next steps. Um, and those might include things like organizational newsletters, professional meetings, and social media resources like Twitter and Facebook. Second, we are developing a webinar series and in-person trainings. So we are developing a series of intensive trainings targeting experts, practitioners, and others who communicate about child sexual abuse. And similar to the e-workshop, these trainings are first designed to familiarize learners with outcomes of the research process, but will also separately consider traditional versus social media communication settings. And um, this goal of providing similar information across different platforms is to ensure different, different learning styles can readily be um, accommodated so that our results and recommendations are more disseminable. Uh, and then we'll have a separate training designed for agency leaders to help them effectively transmit communication strategies to their frontline staff. Third, we are developing a communications toolkit, and this will really um, be very critical to outreach efforts. It will help communicators adapt research findings to specific policy challenges and fields of practice. Toolkits are being developed to provide exemplary materials, that demonstrate how to apply research-based framing recommendations to different types of communication and will typically um, include practical guidelines like talking points. It will include frequently asked questions that model unproductive and reframed modes of communicating about an issue. There will be some sample opinion pieces too, like speeches, blog posts, and op-eds, and sample tweets that are all annotated to reveal specific framing strategies. And lastly, we are going to develop materials for journalists. Um, in fact, one of our expert research consultants is a journalist who reports on child sexual abuse prevention efforts, um, Luke Malone, who presented last week with Elizabeth Letourneau. So we are going to be convening journalists to report on child sexual abuse or related areas to present our findings. And we'll convene them and then request feedback on our findings and also explore different questions with them like, what would make child sexual abuse prevention newsworthy to you? Um, what data, training, resources, or tools would you need to tell stories about child sexual abuse prevention? And what do you think are best practices that reporters should follow in reporting on prevention? And then based on responses from the journalists, we will develop training materials, again, including frequently asked questions and example language um, and text for journalists to support accurate and effective reporting on child sexual abuse prevention. So that concludes my presentation. I want to first thank our research partners at the Frameworks Institute. They are the communication methods experts in this work, and we could not have completed it without them and their insight. We also want to thank our funders at the NICHD who saw value in the vision of this proposed work and of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank my colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and specifically the Moore Center for Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse, particularly the principal investigator, Dr. Elizabeth Letourneau. Um, thank you also to those of you who joined us and we will now open the conversation for a Q&A. Thanks so much for that, Rebecca. It's a, it's a fascinating piece of work. Um, I might start with one question, actually, myself, if that's all right. Uh, and there are, there are some coming through on the chat, which is fantastic, which we can discuss over the next 10 minutes or so. Just a quick one from me. Um, I found 
the whole study fascinating and some aspect, aspects of it quite surprising. I just wanted to ask whether or not any of the outcomes surprised you. So is there any aspects of this, these framings that worked despite your expectations or vice versa? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question about what was surprising. There were a few things um, and I'll pick one. So as I've mentioned, when we did the frames testing, we did use a lot of frames um, and we had to go through two, two rounds of frames because we were having difficulty moving the needle. Um, and one of the frames that both Elizabeth and I were interested in testing was actually that of the use of crisis language when talking about child sexual abuse, just crisis language, meaning emphasizing how much of a significant and critical problem that child sexual abuse poses. And both she and I hypothesized that a crisis frame would actually significantly shift public thinking away from perceptions of child sexual abuse as preventive. And in the experimental survey, that is not what we found. We actually found the frame had no effect on any of our key outcomes. Um, and I think that's this is generally a good thing because many organizations use a crisis mindset when they're communicating about child sexual abuse. But it also can, as I was talking about some of the challenges and opportunities and where the public mindset is right now, this thinking can also distract people from recognizing child sexual abuse as preventable and encourage them more to focus on pre pre responding to things really just after the fact. Fascinating. And that hopefully helps one of our uh, viewers today, Todd, who was interested in whether or not some frames were unsuccessful and what those might be. Uh, be giving us a little bit of an insight there. I'll move on to a couple of others. Uh, one in particular from John in Dublin. Uh, John mentions that internet technologies mean that CSA is manifesting globally as well as locally, and we know that very well. It's a, a borderless issue. Um, he says public attitudes and government amenability to CSA as a preventable issue may vary globally. Uh, are there future global plans for research? So would this type of approach be replicable and um, what would be some of the complexities involved in that? Do you have any views on that? Yeah, that's a, a very multi-part question. So I don't know if I'll, I'll touch on all of the items. You might have to ping me about some of them, but it is a really good question. And this is something that we are starting to think more about globally. Um, the Moore Center is doing more global work and partnering with more um, smart partners in other continents, which I think is, is really great. We, we haven't yet started to think about extending this work to our global partners, but I, that is definitely something that we could do and that some of our partners would be particularly interested in. Um, we have some great collaborators in the EU who would be really interested in, in doing this kind of work. Um, and there are also partners in Africa and in South America who are working to better understand the prevalence of the problem of child sexual abuse within their, their continents and, and specific countries. And I think they would also be interested in this, um, this type of work, but this is not something that we're currently acting on. And I'm glad you mentioned the EU there because um, um, just to give a bit more context for that question, the Moore Center has been contributing to the EU's prevention network for some time uh, and will continue to do that. It's a really important partnership. Just moving on to another question, uh, one from Sarah. Sarah asks, whether the interviews distinguish between CSA within a family setting uh, or at organizations outside the home? That was not a specific question that was targeted in the individual interviews, but is something that would be interesting to look at. Uh, when we did this project, we really were focusing just broadly on how do people view child sexual abuse overall? So there, there were questions about that, that got into some of that context, but we didn't ask specifically about what do you think about child sexual abuse in different contexts? So when members of the public and practitioners and experts were asked about child sexual abuse broadly and what they thought about it, what they thought were some of the contributing factors, we did see people mentioning some of those contextual factors in their answers um, and recognition that there are different organizational factors that might contribute to um, perpetration and perpetration prevention needs um, and similar with like family environments, so it might be different, but we did not ask about those specifically. Thank you. And, a, and a, an important clarification question from Sandra, who asks, what's the source of the statistic that CSA is most often committed by other children and adolescents? Something that you mentioned during your presentation. 
be 100% sure I'm saying um, exactly the right statistics. But there's work coming out of our center that's focused on understanding the prevalence of child sexual abuse and efforts to prevent child sexual abuse in organizational settings. And this work is in partnership with five major um, child serving organizations nationally in the United States. And so they're they're capturing a lot of information about like who is experiencing child sexual abuse and, and what is what are the features of that child sexual abuse. And so that's where we got the 70% number is from youth in youth serving organizations and from leaders in youth serving organizations reporting those numbers. Um, and the 50%, uh, up to 50% is also from people who have survived child sexual abuse. And that's older, those are older numbers though. Thanks so much for that. And a question here, which I think is a general question about prevention interventions in general, but I think it's something interesting to pick up. Uh, Wendy says that as foster parents, we've lived with young people who were later incarcerated for CSA. Um, she'd be interested in education on how to identify possible offenders earlier um, and whether or not there are specific trainings for foster parents. Um, I think mm. one point here is that we, we always think of prevention in broad terms. In some, ter in some cases, interventions may focus specifically on people with a sexual attraction to children, but also it would be um, working closely with youth serving organizations and other volunteers and staff who work in close proximity to children. Um, do you have any reflections on that or any experience on the, the foster parent um, circumstance or dynamic in particular? I do have some thoughts on that. I get off the top of my head, I cannot think of anything that's specific to foster parents, but we do have, there are two curricula that I'm thinking of that overlap somewhat with, with the, the ask. Um, so one of them is something that's coming out of uh, our center, which is more focused again on, on perpetration prevention and less on detecting signs, um, but it's responsible behavior with younger children and focusing on, on educating youth when they're moving into puberty or at the beginning of the, the puberty, pubertal phase and understanding appropriate boundaries or sexual boundaries, consent, um, who and what is appropriate, sex, who, who is appropriate for sexual behavior and what is appropriate sexual behavior and how to, again, um, get consent for those behaviors. So focusing directly on communicating with children is particularly important. And then organizations like Darkness to Light um, have great they have they have a great training and train the trader model as well um that i know they have done some work with foster parents but i don't know if they i don't know if it it's just like specific to foster families um but their training is really focused on identifying signs of people who might be at risk for engaging in child sexual abuse which it sounds like kind of overlaps pretty well with what the question asked thanks for that rebecca and just one final question on this study in particular you mentioned the next steps and how the, the group of subject matter experts that we've engaged with will be taking this forward. Um, do we have any plans or particular hopes for tracking its effects over the coming months and years? Because none of these processes are slow. And when you're dealing with perceptions and, and shifting perceptions, it's, it's, a, it's the long-term game. So any thoughts on that would be, I think, really useful for our, our viewers. Yeah, so I can I can keep it brief, but yes. Yeah, so the hope is that we can get that information out to spread the promote the toolkit, promote awareness about how to use it. And we certainly don't view this work as complete, but we do plan on tracking yes how many people are engaging and using the toolkit and are interested and seeking funding to be able to evaluate um, how those toolkits and training materials are received. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for that. We're just about on time. So we're going to leave people to the rest of their day. But thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I hope you found it um, uh, insightful and interesting uh, and provoking some more internal thinking on your side. I was struck by something that you said, which is that the fact that the public understand that CSA is preventable does not translate into deeper thinking about how to prevent it. Um, so I think that's a really important lesson for us to take away from today. So just before we go, um, we wanted to mention that next week will be the final discussion in this series, uh, Help Wanted, Helping People Stay Safe. 
and it will look more specifically at the help wanted intervention that Rebecca mentioned today. Um, and that will be presented by Amanda Rizika, Deputy Director at the Moore Centre, uh, and Ryan Shields, um, a close collaborator of the Moore Centre. Um, so please do tune in and register if you haven't already. Um, so finally, to wrap up, uh, our work continues and the need for prevention remains. So we'd welcome any of you who are interested to consider supporting the Moore Centre's mission and joining our donor family. And you can find out more about the centre on the Bloomberg School of Public Health website. Uh, and any and all support uh, is always very much appreciated. Thank you for joining us today and have a great week.